Hey, hey, everyone. This is Carlos. I'm the CEO at Product School. Today, I'm here with Brian Talking, who's the head of product at Open Door. Open Door is a huge company. So, Brian, why don't you just start by telling us more about your company as well as your role there? Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thanks for having me, Carlos. Uh, excited to be here and and, and chat with you. Um, so, Open Door is an online real estate um company and, and marketplace to, to, to buy and sell real estate. Um, we make it super simple, uh, seamless, um, and easy to, to sell your home. You go online, um, answer a few questions, and we'll make you an all-cash offer uh, to, to, to buy your home and move on your, your timeline. So we've been around for about 10 years now, um, went public a few years ago, um, and uh, um, are really excited about the journey and path that we're, we're on to make uh, real estate easier, better, um, and empower people's uh, moving progress. So, so very excited um, about the company. Very excited to be here and, and, and talk to you about it. Uh, so your your official title is head of product, and I know that can be misleading depending on, on the context. Like some companies would call like the only product manager head of product. Uh, what does a head of product mean at Open Door? Uh, sure. Yes, and it can can mean lots lots of different things and. Um, uh, I personally and, and the company tries not to get wrapped up in, in, in titles too much, but in, in this context, it means um, accountability uh, for uh, the product organization and the design organization. So I lead, lead, lead those organizations, um, and at the end of the day, uh, uh, means full accountability across the company for the products that, that, that we put out there and, and deliver and making sure that it meets um, both, both customers and business needs. And, and how big is the org that you oversee? Uh, so between product and design, uh, the org is probably about uh, 50, 55 people or so. All right. Well, um, now we're going to take you back to the beginning because I can imagine your first PM job wasn't that big. So how did you get into product? Yeah. Um, so I've, I've, I've always loved building things um, and, and creating things. It actually started back um, when I was in, in, in middle school, my brother and I. Uh, founded a nonprofit um, here here in Seattle called called Beams and Dreams, um, and I didn't know what a product manager was or or anything about a PM, and there was no no software associated, but it was just about building something and and bringing something of value into the world, and, and sort of continued that entrepreneurial thread through through college. Um, one of the best experiences I ever had was running um, a, a retail store on campus, um, and then took that experience. Uh, to Uber, where I actually started originally on the operations team, much smaller company. This was back in 2012, um, and really wanted to get closer to the technology and have scaled impact. And I think um, being on the product side re really helps you um, have that scaled impact across what, what ultimately, obviously, for Uber became a global company touching touching millions of lives. So formally transitioned to the product side there, um, ran all of Uber's uh, carpooling products, Uber Pool being the most notable. Um, grew, grew the team out there, uh, had a great five-year run there, almost five years, um, and then I've been at Open Door for the last five years, focused uh, initially on a lot of our um, internal operations and uh, tooling products, and then um, sort of over the course of those five years have have done many different product job, jobs at the company, um, recently taking on the, 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 the full scope today. So you move from ops into product, which today it's... Um, Actually, a very, very common path for, for ops professionals. Back in the day, it wasn't that obvious. I can I remember still like most of the PMs would come with a technical background. So how were you able to make your case at Uber? Yeah. Um, so so I, I, I came from a quasi-technical background, or as, as I call it, pretend engineering. Um, so I had an, enough to be dangerous. Um, and so it wasn't a, a full cold start on, on that front. Um, but uh, I think I was, I was fortuitous. Obviously, Uber was growing rapidly, and um, there was this sweet spot of being on the operations side. You really get to know and understand the business context, and, and, and you actually talk to customers a lot. Back in the early days, um, every ops team member did support tickets directly. So the core bones of, like, do you know how to build things with technology? I had a little bit of that. Can you understand and empathize with the customer? And then can you synthesize information and, and coalesce that into bringing something to life um, uh, sort of came together and, and uh, Uber being a, a growing company afforded me the opportunity to make that transition. And, then, and Uber is actually one of those examples of incredible product uh, with incredible product team. One of the pioneers who actually had to create this type of infrastructure, at global levels, like a marketplace with, it's within marketplaces. 
Um, so I can see why like op had a lot of impact. Like I, I still know today the customer success or other ops functions still are underrated. And um, I know why, how it's so important for PMs to, to really stay in touch with the customer. And then we, we hear these models around, like you have to talk to customers. Yeah, right. But like at the end of the day, most of the PMs don't want to do it or they still don't come from this type of ops or, or success background. So in, in your case, like what is it that, that you see that, that you think that made it so special, that made someone at the top to say, you know what, we need to invest in ops people to elevate their impact and, may, and turn them into products? Um, I, th I think both both Uber and Open Door have um, sort of a unique, uh, some somewhat unique um, type of product where it's very online offline. Um, there's obviously a core digital surface area that customers are interacting with um, that that is is the bulk of the uh, customer experience that 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 people are interacting with day to day. Um, but the reality is, in order to actually deliver the product. It's, it's super heavy on the operation side, whether that's in Uber's case, um, being able to onboard, train, retain drivers, um, and, and actually run and manage the marketplace. Back then, uh, not everything was automated, and so a lot of stuff was done manually by the operations team. And on the open door side, real estate um, is still an antiquated process. There's a lot of magic that happens on, on, on the back end of our systems to make it simple and seamless for the customer. Um, but the reality is the best products get built when the ops team who understands the complexity gets married with a digital product team and uh, who can deliver a delightful customer experience. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And both Uber and Open Door just happen to be places where that online offline uh, interaction is, is so deeply important that it actually elevates the role of product and operations working together. I, I agree. And I, and I really hope that more companies, more product functions start appreciating the value of ops as well as customer success and, and see more leaders like you that bring that background to the table because at the end of the day, that's what really keeps the light on. That's what brings revenue to the company. And it's not just about building, it's also about shipping the right way and making sure that your customers are using your product. Absolutely, I agree. And another parallel that I see between Uber and Open Door is, is the marketplace dynamics. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about how that experience at Uber helped you then uh, apply to Open Door? Yeah, uh, marketplaces have, um, I, I'd say, one super unique characteristic of the product, which is many stakeholders who aren't always uh, in, in, in perfect alignment on, on what they want. And so you have to be able to build the marketplace in, in a way that works with all the complex stakeholders, whether at Uber, that's um, riders, drivers, cities, et cetera, whether at Open Door, that's sellers, buyers, uh, uh, the larger uh, real estate ecosystem that, that, that we partner with and, and, and play a role in. And so I think from a, from a building perspective, it's really interesting because it's a very multifaceted problem. Um, there's not a single customer, there's not a single entity um, that you're thinking about. And so I, I think um, you're right that, that Uber and Open Door share, share similar characteristics there. And I think it's what makes marketplaces so uh, difficult to build, but also what's so exciting and, and what's exciting about trying to build marketplaces in a space that um, haven't been disrupted for, for a long time. Obviously, uh, transportation um, was, was relatively stagnant and, and, and the taxi industry and, and ecosystem and real estate um, also hasn't made a ton of progress since sort of the MLS came online um, maybe 20 years ago. And so I think it's really exciting to say, okay, how do you bring the combination of, of software, operations, and this complex stakeholder management to come together in a, in a new, better version of a marketplace that works for everyone. And in your experience now at, at Open Door, um, how is that product team structured to make sure that you are serving the different stakeholders? Yeah. So at, at its highest level, and this actually isn't too dissimilar from uh, from how Uber was structured back in the day, but that's at its highest level, um, there's a team that we call um, transactions and, and, and operations, sort of our um, building products for our internal operations. That is all about the efficiency and effectiveness of, of kind of our, our delivery engine and how we actually deliver our products. And then we have a consumer org 
um, that is focused uh, um, on the relevant uh, stakeholders uh, in the ecosystem, whether that's uh, sellers, buyers, agents, or, or other partners. Um, and so uh, the highest level grouping is sort of internal versus external, um, and then within that external bucket, uh, focusing on the individual stakeholders. And so in the case of Open Door, you have the, the buyers and the sellers, and then you, you, you treat agents as a third different stakeholder? Uh, we, we, we do, um, and, and we, we actually work closely with that community um, on a variety of different fronts. Obviously, a, a number of uh, people in, in real estate still want to engage with representation through, through the agent community. And so um, we, we uh, do and have built um, specific products for, for agents, and that, that is a, a team and a um, space that we think about. Um, as a as a core constituent for open door agents, I, I find that fascinating, and uh, especially in, in products that are not marketplaces, they're still different personas. But in, it's typical to to have a product or a head of product still keeping all of those personas under the same team. While in marketplaces, I've seen that dichotomy where there tends to be a product team focused on the buyer, another product team focused on the seller. As you mentioned, there might be other personas. In this case, the agent, and then. Separately, there's the internal product, like the, the core platform that is supporting the, the, the operations. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely right. And I, th I think that tends to work best because it gives the right space for a product team to be able to uh, understand their customer, navigate the core complexity, um, and deeply empathize with what needs to be built, um, but also have enough space and, and latitude to be able to optimize for, for, for their customer. Um, the magic happens when all three of those are, or all sides of the marketplace come together. Um, and, and, and that's what um, ultimately has to happen um, for, for, for us to be successful or for any marketplace to be successful, um, is you can't just focus on one side too much. You have to focus on everything. So, and I hear you talk about design as part of your product core. So what is the role that design plays in all of this? Uh, de design's hugely important um, at, at Open Door. Uh, we are trying to bring a better elevated customer experience to um, an industry that that is not known for having better elevated customer experiences. And, and obviously design is at the forefront of that. Um, we, we think of our value props as simplicity and certainty and convenience. Um, and that uh, is, is not just the core product and the operations of how we deliver that product, but also the digital experience that customers are going through. So um, our, our PMs, our designers, frankly, our engineers and our operators uh, work super closely together to, to, to deliver that product. And we actually organize around what we call EPODs for the, the traditional EPD and product and design being end product operations and design. Um, and we make sure that those units have aligned mission goals um, and come together to, to leverage everyone's unique skill sets to deliver an amazing product. So who is typically included in one of those pods? Um, so, so it would be your, uh, I think the the traditional end product and design. So, so an EM, a PM, and a designer. Um, the the ad that we would make is an operations counterpart, um, just because of the nature of the product. Um, but in terms of the, uh, that would be the core group, and then obviously, uh, um, uh, it's an engineering team to to actually build the product for customers. And as you think about like, priorities and uh, the different goals that each of these parts will have, but also what is the ultimate goal for you? How do you go about ensuring that that the, all of these different parts are pushing in the same direction? Um, so so we, we try to uh, sort of cascade or ladder um, our, our goals and our metrics. So it's really important that everybody across the company, regardless of their role, understands how their work ladders up to the, to the broader company mission. So um, we have uh, a couple of pillars across the company, and then we sort of decompose that into um, focus areas that, that the teams then um, have, have goals and visions around. And so um, basically it's, it's just a ladder of, of information where we make sure that each, each team building a mission uh, or building a set of products ladders up to a sort of a broader group, which ladders up to a company pillar. Um, and it's it's our job to make sure that at the end of the day, if every team optimizes for for their individual um, a goal and mission, that the outcomes are the ones that we want. So we focus and spend a lot of time on 
inputs and controlling what we can control. And then if we do the best that we can for each one of those teams, uh, we, we believe that will really lead to the outcomes that we want for, for the customer and, and for the business. And just to follow that thread, I'd uh, love to learn more from your own experience defining that cloud strategy. And, and then what are some of those ceremonies that help you um, keep an eye on what things are happening and then potentially make uh, adjustments? So we um, have, a, I guess, a, a somewhat standard um, uh, planning process. Um, so we're, we're just going through our 2024 planning process. Um, and that's where we align at the highest level. What do we want to achieve as a company? Um, what did we learn in 2023? Um, what do we want to pull forward? What do we want to stop doing? And so I think that exercise of reflection, double down and stop, um, is, is pretty important for setting up sort of an, an, an annual plan. And then obviously, uh, once we get into uh, 2024, we decompose that into uh, half yearly and, and, and quarterly plans, which ultimately obviously trans translate into sprints and, and sort of the actual operating cadence of the company. In terms of making sure that we're, we're on the right track, um, we have a, a, a network of, of business reviews that are WBRs, MBRs, and QBRs each uh, weekly business reviews, monthly business reviews, and, and quarterly business reviews um, that make sure that the outputs um, and, and the accountability metrics um, are tracking as we expect. And then we have a set of um, uh, product reviews and design reviews um, that, that we do at, at the team level to have a chance to showcase the work and then discuss the strategy of the product and say, is this moving in the direction that we anticipate and expect? Yeah, and uh, this planning and strategy season, season so completely resonate with that. Yes. Um, always something that I find very interesting as I talk with other product leaders is how they structure their time on a, on a weekly basis. I know that fires happen every time and you have to put them out, but if you spend too much time just putting out fires, it's, it's easy to forget like the broader vision. So in your case, we'd love to kind of take a sneak peek into your calendar and learn more about what are some of those major themes. Yeah. So, um, uh, I spend uh, as much time um, as possible uh, either thinking about the customer or thinking about the, the, the product direction um, and, and, and where we're going. And so my, my calendar, if you, if you look at it, is um, decomposes into a few things uh, outside of the fire drills that, that inevitably come up um, when it's not planning season. Um, they focus on uh, either one-on-ones and team development. Um, so that's about up-leveling our talent, making sure that um, uh, I'm hearing feedback on what's happening across the company and across the org uh, at, at the team level, and then coaching and mentoring um, folks across the, the, the org so that people can do their best work at Open Door, or these product reviews, uh, monthly business reviews, or quarterly business reviews focused on saying, okay, are we heading in the right direction? If not, what edits do we need to make to, to, to the strategy? Um, and then the third part, which um, uh, to, your, to your sort of question earlier, um, is listening to customer calls uh, or talking to customers or reading customer feedback. And I think that's something that, um, you know, it's very easy to get away from uh, both as you um, progress in your career and as you get further and further from those direct interactions. Um, but it's, it's, it's still deeply important. So I actually have a block on my calendar uh, every week for customer feedback and listening. Um, where it's either talking to a customer, listening to to recorded calls, going through user research, um, or something to make sure that I'm staying close to the customer. Love that. So it's time for your team through one-on-ones and other interactions, time for your product through reviews, and, yep. and then time for your customers. Correct. Exactly. That's exactly right. Um, what about um, recruiting and um, you know ensuring that you are bringing in the right talent for your org? Yeah, the, the, the most important thing for uh, recruiting um, and thinking about the team um, that, that I've learned over the course of my career is um, whether it's a PM or a designer, it's easy to put in these, these broad buckets. Hey, you're, you're a PM. Hey, you're a designer. Um, the reality is uh, the skill sets for, for both those roles are so multivariate that, that what we spend time thinking about when, when we recruit is what type of PM, what type of designer? Would be super successful for this specific role. Obviously, there's a cultural aspect to, to open door and what would make anybody successful. But um, a person who is on our uh, consumer seller team 
should have a very different archetype than the person who's doing more operations and systems design as, as a PM, right? And so thinking about, okay, what what is the role? What is this person's role, this specific role? And is this a more technical PM? Is this a more systems-focused PM? Is this a more design-focused PM? Is this a more business-focused PM? Um, and same thing on the design side. So I, I think for us, recruiting is all about identifying, uh, especially for a product as, as large and as an open area as open door, identifying really the specific skill sets or the specific role. Um, that's how we think about recruiting. And um, I'm very excited about this topic, uh, helping people get into product, then as well grow as, as product leaders. And so curious to know, what is your career ladder or competency model? How you think about helping people grow and what are the different options? Um, so, uh, like engineering, um, on both the product and design side, uh, there is a management path as well as an IC path. I think <laughs> over over the years, the engineering IC path for continued career growth has been a little bit um, more mature and robust and well documented in the industry than than the product and design path. Um, but I think it's just as important um, to to have those on the product and design side. Um, and what that ultimately means, and, and I'm happy to talk about uh, the latter and the competencies and, and, and what we value, but at its highest level, excuse me, it is what is the complexity of the problem and what is your ability to identify it and, and solve it independently? And if you can increasingly solve harder and harder problems with increasingly more and more autonomy, that's the way to work your, 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 your way up the product ladder. And so what that means is when you're first starting out, it's very likely somebody else will be defining most of the strategy. You will primarily be learning the ropes of how to execute, how to ship, how to get things out in, in the real world and, and what the iterations are of, of shipping a product. As you get, you know, a next the next step might be um, the strategy is defined, but you independently define the projects that ladder up to that strategy. The next step might be you independently identify this or uh, define the strategy for an unknown problem. The next step might be, hey, you actually identify problems that nobody else in the company is even thinking about. And so I think the more that you can handle that complexity, that ambiguity, and really be like, this is the kernel of truth. This is what we should be focused on because I've looked at all this data, both quantitative and qualitative, both from, from analytical prowess as well as talking to customers. And here's the real opportunity. Um, I think the more the more complexity and the, and the more ambiguity that you can handle, that's the way to grow your, your career, whether it's as an IC or as a, as a manager. And, and I've seen that as uh, the, the career ladder for product matures and there are different options. And some people can continue growing as an individual contributor, but that is not a bad thing that doesn't mean that you are less of a PM than the PMs that decide to start actually managing people. Um, I'm curious to know what you found in your experience that is making successful PMs own strategy. Because I've seen very successful PMs execute somebody's strategy, but sometimes executing executing strategy better doesn't necessarily make you a better strategist. Sure. Yeah. The the um... The reality is, as, as PMs, we, we sit at the center of a lot of different information, um, whether that's technical information from, from the engineering team on what's feasible, customer information, whether that's talking directly to customers ourselves, or the CX team, uh, operational constraints, uh, market research and, and industry news and competitive positioning, uh, finance and the business dynamics um, that, that we have to operate in and the constraints of, of the broader market. Um, and so there's, it can feel like a cacophony of information. And I think that the key to the to a great strategy is to simplify, um, to think about what is the kernel of truth? What is the thing that really, really matters to the customer and the business? And how do I stay intensely focused on that and build only towards that? Otherwise, it, feel, it can feel like you're in um, sort of an, an ocean getting sloshed around of, of a bunch of information. And I think the best strategies have room for flexibility, but are proactive, not just reactive to the last piece of information that, that I've heard. And so I think that's that's the difference as you develop in your career, I think, on, on, on forging a strategy is to really think about what is true and what do I believe will likely continue to be true, not what did I just hear yesterday or last week that will wholesale shift my strategy. I would love, with your permission, I would love to role play that with you as obviously the, the head of product. Uh, as you think about the future, what is true 
and uh, how are you thinking about expanding your product portfolio? So for for open door for real estate, I, I think um, what's true yesterday, true today, and 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 uh, uh, will continue to be true is that um, customers will continue to demand simplicity and certainty um, in a transaction that that's just not that today. Ninety nine percent of transactions still happen the traditional way, which is fraught with uncertainty around price, on timeline, will my home sell? Um, and I think, uh, well, well, that's um, uh, the reality of how things have been have been done for for, for decades. Um, it's not the future that customers are demanding. Everything else around us has modernized, and so I think um, if we can can stay focused on how do we deliver a simple, certain, and effective uh, real estate transaction, um, I think customers will continue to demand that. Um, and bring it online, bring it digital, make it easier, make it faster. That's the way our world has been heading and, and will continue to head. And I think real estate's no different. And so if you think about some of the products that, that we're building and we're developing, it's of that that similar theme. One product that we, we uh, spent some time and launched this year um, is, is called List with Open Door. And so this is, okay, traditional listing process is you list on the MLS, you don't know when you're going to get an offer. You don't know if you'll get an offer. You don't know how much that offer will be for. There's a lot of uncertainty um, and emotional difficulty for, for, for customers there, especially at a time in their life where um, something is, is presumably prompting the move. That thing often tends to be stressful. And so we said, okay, how do we make that experience simpler and more certain for customers? And the reality is we, we have this product, a, a cash offer, which delivers incredible amounts of of certainty and convenience. You get to know exactly how much that offer is worth. You get to pick your close date. You get to align your moving dates um, and, and you can remove all the stress. How do we marry these, these two options where I can list on the open market and see what someone, someone might offer me for my home while having the safety, the security, the convenience and the certainty of, of a cash offer in, in my back pocket. And so that's what List With Open Door is, is you get to hold our offer for 60 days while you list on, on the open market. And so we said, okay, I feel very confident that customers want simplicity and certainty. What they probably also want, or some wants, is to be able to say, hey, what will someone else besides Open Door pay for my home? And I'm willing to, to bear a little bit of inconvenience to, to, to find that out. How do we bring those things together for a magical product for customers? Um, but thank you for role playing this with me. Um, yes. Because I think in product, it's a lot of these things that it's very important to define the, the, the statement, the problem statement, or what is the current situation. And in your case, you see what's true is that it's, it's a lot of uncertainty. Like the real estate market is kind of like a black box for, for many, right? Like you don't know how much your house is worth. And what is, in my opinion, not that obvious is that a lot of people will feel comfortable selling or buying houses online in some cases without even seeing that house, at least being in that in the house. I mean, you come from Uber, which I can imagine the average ticket average ticket price in the US would be like sub ten dollars, sure. and now your average ticket price is probably more than hundred x. Yeah. So how the uh, creating that ease for the customer and let them you know use online for something as important as buying or selling their house, I think it's absolutely incredible. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, for for both Uber and Open Door, actually trust is is deeply important. Um, obviously, Uber has grown. Um, uh, very, very large at this point. And so there, there's an inherent amount of trust in the system. But back in the early days, you know, there was getting in the car with a stranger like that. How do you solve that trust problem? Right. And and that's um, that's something Uber had to overcome. And, and Open Door obviously doesn't have the stranger problem, but but does have the yes, this is life's biggest transaction and it's hard and it's it's difficult and it's stressful. And so how do we bring trust to the customer when they are transacting in, in, in a new way that that maybe their neighbor, their neighbor didn't transact in or their parents haven't transacted in and, and sort of um, trust is, is deeply important in how we use both the digital and operations to build trust. I said 100x, but I think it's more like 1,000x and in some cases even 10,000x the price of an Uber ride. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I mean, it, the, 
the price almost doesn't matter. What matters is that for a customer, this is the, for many customers, this is their largest financial asset, the largest financial transaction. For most customers, for all customers, that's not true at Uber. So, so yes, um, you know, whether, whether it's a thousand X, 10,000 X, a hundred thousand X, what, what matters is that for a customer, they'll do this once every seven years. And it's the biggest thing that they'll do uh, financially for, for many of them in their lives. And, and that's not true at Uber. So different problems, um, but it doesn't change the fact that trust is deeply important for both products. And, and how are you thinking about AI in terms of helping you accelerate your mission? Um, so 2023, um, obviously, it's been a big year for, for AI, LLMs, uh, uh, buzzword, buzzworthy and, and, and noteworthy um, uh, all year long. Um, we have been using machine learning, sort of a predecessor, if you will, to, to AI, as well as AI uh, for quite some time, almost since the beginning of Open Door on our pricing engine of how do we deliver uh, online prices and actually price price homes effectively. Um, so we've had a lot of the uh, infrastructure um, uh, and, and actually practice doing this on, on our pricing side. Um, what, what's changed and what we're continuing to look at uh, last year and into next year is how do we use that and the new technologies around LLMs um, across the stack. So there are massive applications on the consumer side. Um, we, we recently have rolled out um, an assistant for people to help answer, basically use some of our um, proprietary insights and, and, and data um, to be able to answer uh, real estate questions that they may have early in the process when they're thinking about, is now a good time to sell? Should I sell? Um, how much is my home worth? Those types of questions, um, they can they can now get easy access uh, via text um, to be able to get an, uh, answers to those questions. And then on the internal side, how do we use AI, whether that's textual or visual, audio, et cetera, um, to be able to not make not only make our operations more efficient, but actually more consistent and effective. Um, how do we have um, sort of internal co-pilots that, that help our teams do their jobs better? And so we're spending a lot of time um, thinking about both those problem spaces. Brian, it's been a pleasure to learn from you. Thank you so much for the time. Carlos, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it.